in 2 Timothy chapter 4 tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and uh, we're going to wrap up the last half of chapter 4, finish this epistle, and uh, as Pastor Brandon said, we're going to start Titus next week. The Bible uh, says this in verse 6. I'm just going to read a couple verses and then we'll pray. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Father, we're so grateful for your word, and God, just grateful that you have canonized the Holy Scriptures, and it is your living word. God, it is as alive today as it was when you inspired these authors, and uh, these books, these letters were penned for specific people and for specific churches, God, in a specific time context. And yet, God, we receive it as your word for us today. And Father, we want to have that heart that is really tender to the Holy Scriptures and tender to your Holy Spirit as he speaks to us. And as the word is applied to very specific areas of our lives, God, would we yield to that. And Father, would your word tonight be met with an obedient heart, God, a heart filled with faith to believe you for great things. God, we pray that you would especially strengthen those who serve you faithfully, as uh, I know many can grow weary in doing good and, and can be tempted to lose heart. Uh, but God, I pray that you would help us to not only run our race well, but to finish it strong. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Paul has um, been indicating kind of directly that uh, his time is up and that, you know, he perceived that he was not too far from really being with the Lord, from physically departing from this planet and being with God in heaven. And, you know, he's, he's indicated that, uh, although not absolutely directly in a direct way, in these verses as he wraps up, you know, this uh, final portion to Timothy, he really does directly indicate that he knows and just in case you don't know, this is Paul's second imprisonment. You know, the, the, the first imprisonment really was Paul being under house arrest when he was in Rome. He was released. He ministered, of, you know, for a time in various places. We don't absolutely know all the details of that. But he ended up being imprisoned again uh, by Nero. And uh, many people believe we're talking about 64 AD, probably after the great fire of Rome, and, uh, of course, Nero blamed that fire on the Jews and on the Christians. And what ensued was a, a real uh, persecution against the people of God. And, and some suppose that the Apostle Paul was, in fact, imprisoned for this. And, um, you know, as one of the preeminent or premier leaders of the early church, Nero would have, it would have been, you know, very politically favorable for him to take one of the... Uh, leaders of the church and uh, to put him to death as kind of a scapegoat for the fire. And so, you know, the apostle's been uh, in the Mamertine prison probably for some period of time, uh, and he's communicating his final words to his son in the faith, Timothy, who had been a faithful servant. You know, he, he had served God faithfully. He had served Paul faithfully as a friend, but also as a, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And and so, you know, Paul was always inclined to encourage Timothy, who was a mighty man in the Lord, and yet, you know, as a young pastor, he also had a lot of hang-ups, you know, a lot of insecurities, a lot of personal struggles, and, you know, as Paul faithfully did, he came along and supported and strengthened Timothy. Here, he states specifically that he knows his time is short. And, you know, I think, I've said this before to you in this study, that, you know, when you know that your death is imminent, you're very careful about the words that you share because, because each word is valuable. You know that you have few words to speak because of the time allotted, and therefore you make those words worthwhile. And so Paul is very carefully sharing his words. And, you know, when Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, he said this, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with um, this verse chapter 1, verse 22, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
Paul really uh, encapsulates his philosophy on life and on death. And, you know, I mean, it's a bold thing to say when you're alive that to die is gain, to have that bold, you know, courageous, fearless view of death is one thing, it's one thing to say it, you know, when it appears that you have many days left. But, but when your death is imminent, sometimes the reality of how you feel about that is brought to bear. Uh, and I think that what we see here at the end of Paul's life is he really meant it when he said it. You know, for as you look at Paul's life and you consider who he was as a, a faithful minister of the gospel, I think that the evidence of what he said is really borne out in his life as you consider how God used him and how faithful he was even in times of difficulty. Truly, for Paul, to live was Christ. It was all about Jesus. Christ was not only his center, but he was always the object of his worship. He, I think, sincerely could say, not without fault, right, because Paul was just a human like you and I are, but he really could say that he lived his life for Christ. But then, you know, as he is just maybe weeks or, you know, less away from being martyred for his faith, he really did believe that to die was gain. He saw death as just uh, stepping into everlasting life. And I appreciate that about the apostle. And I I see those in his words. You know, as he uh, writes in these verses, beginning as I just had had read, we're going to see that he viewed his life in three different ways. Number one, he viewed his life as a sacrifice. He said this, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. You know, it does does take a little bit of knowledge of um, the Old Testament mosaic system to understand what it is that Paul is saying when he says drink offering. Um, So let me just explain to you. When the sacrifices were made, the daily sacrifices, morning and evening in the tabernacle or, or the temple, When the lamb was sacrificed and placed on the altar, they would also, over that sacrifice, pour out a a drink offering. And uh, it was a specific uh, substance, and it was a specific amount. And at a specific time, the priest would apply it. And, you know, as it was applied to that sacrifice that was burning, it would rise up as a vapor. It would be a fragrant aroma to God but it would also be almost transparent, right? Which is kind of how uh, vapor is. It's, it's, uh, you can barely see it. And I think Paul is saying it's, it's also vapor or a mist is there for a moment and then it's gone. And I think Paul is, is looking at his life and his imminent death. He's saying, hey, my life is right now being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice of Christ Um, You know, he referred himself as a drink offering to the church at Philippi on their sacrifice of faith. And so his life was really fleeting. It was was there for a moment, but soon to be gone. It was self-sacrificial, right? He lived, he really did lay down his life for Christ and his gospel and then also for the people of God in that it was a fragrant aroma to the Lord. And yet, In addition to that, finally, I would say that Paul always was seeking not to be exalted or lifted up. He did not want to be the one that was preeminent. Paul was happy serving like John the Baptist did. You remember when John was pointing the finger to Christ, he said, I must decrease so that he will increase. And I do think that that's really the heart of a servant to be willing to to decrease, to be transparent, to drift into the background so that Christ can be preeminent. I think it's interesting also to note that Paul really viewed uh, what was happening in his life as the ordained will of God. You know, he's not complaining about the Roman government. He's not attributing his imminent death uh, specifically to Rome. He knows that at the end of the day, even in this, that God is in control. He said that his departure was at hand. This word departure was used uh, in ancient Greek as a euphemism for death. So this was how this word was applied if you were speaking Greek back then. When you would hoist anchor and set sail, this word uh, in Greek was used. When you would strike your tent, so if you're a Bedouin, you know, you're you're living uh, a life uh, that was nomadic 
And so you would set your tent, your tent would be there for a while, and then you would strike your tent and move on to the next place. This Greek w- word was used when a person would strike their tent. Um, when a prisoner was loosed from uh, servitude or slavery um, or from prison, set free, released from prison, this word would be used. They would depart from, from that prison or from you know, being under the yoke of bondage of a master. And then it was also used when a yoke, uh, when an ox was unyoked. So, you know, if you're plowing furrows, you would hook uh, the machinery up to the ox and the ox would pull it and create the furrow. When it was loosened from that machinery, this Greek word was used. And so, you know, the the symbolism, the imagery is just so beautiful. You know, Paul wasn't afraid of death. He understood that, that it was just a departure into really everlasting life. As this body is laid in the grave, it was almost like the anchor was being hoisted up and the real spirit of humanity was being set sail or the physical tent. You know, Paul would use uh, the, a, a tent as an illustration of the physical body when he uh, wrote to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, he says this, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So as beautiful as your tent may be, right? I mean, if you go camping, you know, you pull that tent out, it's musty and, and it's, it's wrinkled and it's got dirt in it from the last time you camped and, and you're okay in it maybe for a day or for two days. Maybe, maybe you go glamping, you don't go camping. Um, you're used to more sophisticated, but if you pull out that tent, it's okay for a little bit, but in the end, you just want to be back in your house because that's really what you're, you're made for. And so in a way, Paul's like, hey, this thing that we have even though we apply the cosmetics, even though we work out consistently and regularly, even though we modify our diet so we don't get overweight, even though we clothe it with the finest threads, the truth is, it's just our temporary dwelling place. We're made for something more. And Paul looked forward to putting off this body and putting on that heavenly body that's been made by Christ. And, you know, he conveys that in these words. His life was a sacrifice. He also saw himself as an athlete. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. So the second way that he illustrates his, his life is as an athlete. You know, maybe he's thinking about running a race here. Maybe he's thinking about wrestling. Maybe he's thinking about boxing. When I think about fighting the good fight, I think UFC because I live in Las Vegas. And I have friends who are UFC fighters and, uh, and own uh, gyms that are UFC fight gyms. Uh, if you've ever seen a UFC fight, you know, man, it is knocked down, bloody, uh, sometimes bare-fisted. I mean, it's just rough. And the, however many, uh, however many, it's, um, it's not innings for sure because that would be baseball. What is the word I'm looking for? For however many rounds, thank you, uh, 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 about goes, you know it's, it is literally knock down, drag out. And sometimes ministry is like that. Sometimes serving God is like a UFC match. And I think as Paul looked back, he's like, man, I have fought the good fight. I didn't, I didn't bail. Uh, I didn't throw in the white flag. I didn't surrender. I didn't tap out for the things that God had set before me. I continued until the very end. I have run the race. I finished the race. It's not just about having a good beginning. You know, I see many Christians start well, uh, but then struggle in the middle and maybe not even get to the very end. God wants us to have not just a strong beginning or a a healthy middle. God wants us to, to finish faithfully, to get to the point where we complete what God has started in our lives, to run the whole race. And you know, he supplies the strength to get you through. So the Apostle Paul saw himself as an athlete. He also saw himself as a steward. And he says, I've kept the faith. And so the third uh, illustration I think that Paul gives as he's wrapping his own life up is that he was a, a steward. You know, he was a faithful servant. He kept the faith, which means he didn't abandon the gospel. 
He didn't deconstruct his faith. He didn't abandon his trust in Jesus Christ. And I'm, sh- I'm sure there were many opportunities for the Apostle Paul to do that. You know, like the believers that were being written to by the author of Hebrews, you know, they had drifted back to Judaism. And Paul, I'm sure, had many opportunities where he, he could have gone back to the Jewish faith and to the Mosaic law uh, and to Moses or Abraham as leaders to temple worship. But Paul did not do that. He stayed steadfast in his trust in Jesus Christ. He was also faithful. So as a steward, he knew that he'd been entrusted by God with, with a calling, not a vocation, but a calling. And his calling was to the Gentiles. And so the apostle Paul not only received that calling, but he was faithful with it to the very end because he knew that he had been entrusted with a calling by God. You know, and that's true for all of us. All of us have spiritual gifts that God has given to us. All of us have a calling that God has laid out that he has handed to us to be faithful with. Sometimes I think, you know, we look at our spiritual gifts as if we have really uh, the ability to use them at our own discretion. And then whether we choose to or we don't choose to is really up to us. And we don't remember sometimes that we're just simply stewarding something that God has given to us. And one day when we stand before him, he will require an account. I'm uh, reminded of the parable of the talents and how, you know, each was given something by God and with the expectation that it would be invested for him and for his divine purposes. And so whatever it is that God has given to you, make sure you're investing it in things that ultimately will bring glory and honor to him. And then again, he says in verse 8, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, so as he's run his race, he's fought the fight, the good fight, he knows that there will be a reward. There will be a reward. I know for you, probably there have been times where you've been serving God, and maybe it's not gone the way that you thought it would go. Maybe it's not been, there's not been the response that you thought that there would be. Maybe, in fact, there's been adversity and difficulty and opposition, and you've thought, man, what am I doing this for? You know, I don't really see the fruit that, that I want to see. Is that all that this really is about? And, uh, you know, it's important for us to be reminded that God, in His grace, one day, is going to reward us for the faithful investment that we have made. Paul says that there is a Stephanos, not a diadem, not the crown of a king, but there is a a Stephanos, what was given to the victor in the marathon. This has been, this crown of righteousness will be given to me on that day. Christ himself is going to reward me for those things that I have done for his name, and for his glory in this life. And, and then Paul says, as a word of encouragement, not just for me, but for all who have loved his appearing. I just, I really appreciate this about the Apostle Paul because, you know, serving God to him was not an institutional thing. Paul doesn't say, hey, this is not just true for me, but for all the people who have fed the machine. He doesn't say that. For all the people who have uh, pushed the institution forward. He doesn't say that. He says, for all those who have loved his appearing. And, you know, it does beg the question, are we talking about his first appearing or are we talking about looking forward to his second appearing? And I, I would say both. Both. To, to, to love the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He appeared the first time to take away our sins and to pay a penalty that we deserve to pay so that we can live in eternity with God. But not only that, to live with this anticipation that he is coming again, to love that, to prioritize that, to center our lives around that, to be in a way consumed by that. Those people who live in that place ultimately will be rewarded by God. It's a beautiful thing. He says in verse 9, Be diligent to come to me quickly, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. 
Now, Paul is going to begin to name some people here at the end of this epistle, and the majority of them are, you know, uh, noted for good things. There are a few, though, that Paul notes uh, in, you know, not really a positive light. The first one, I mean, Paul says, hey, Timothy, he knows his time is short, so Timothy, come to me quickly, like the window's short for you to get here and uh, for you to actually be present with me. But, you know, he was feeling the, the pain of being forsaken, and he names a person, Demas, who had forsaken him. And, you know, you might, if you're a student of the word, you're thinking right now, wait a minute, I've heard Demas' name before. Demas was mentioned in the epistle to the church at Colossae. Uh, and Demon, Demas was also mentioned uh, in the epistle to Philemon. And both of those times that Paul mentions Demas, it's in a positive context. So he's mentioned with Mark and he's mentioned with Dr. Luke as part of this really close-knit uh, ministry team that had endured a lot and had seen God do many great things. Uh, unfortunately, man, this is such a sad note uh, that one of the individuals on that close-knit ministry team that had, you know, they had built bonds of friendship over the course of time. They had not only uh, been in the presence of God, I'm sure exhilarated by the great things that God had done. They had also probably walked through the valley of the shadow of death. They'd, they'd suffered together. Um, they, they had experienced probably betrayal together. And, um, and so, so it would seem that there was this just real close-knit bond that the four of these had. And unfortunately, one of the four ended up forsaking the apostle Paul and he forsook Paul because he loved this present world more than he loved the things of God. It would appear that um, he, and, and some commentators say that um, he had a love for money. And so because he had this love for money, he, had, he pursued the things of this world, a, a comfortable lifestyle. He left for Thessalonica. Things for sure were difficult being associated with the apostle Paul. Paul was a dangerous man to be associated with. And, you know, Rome was not an easy place to be while also being associated with Paul. And so it would appear that as things got difficult, as the adversity got really hard, what happened was Demas, there was a weakness in Demas that was revealed, and he ended up not only forsaking the apostle Paul, but it would appear that he also turned away from the ministry calling on his life for an easier life, for, for a life that was really oriented around the things of this world. You know, it's just such a, a, a strong reminder for us, you know, that, that I think a lot of times our character isn't revealed when things are going good. Many times our character is revealed when things are difficult, when, when it does get really adverse, when it is really hard. It's okay. I mean, it's easy, I think, to get along with everybody and, and to have an appearance of really pouring your heart into the ministry and serving God while things are easy and things are going well and people you know, are favorable towards the work of God through your life. But man, when things do get difficult when there is adversity, when there's persecution, you know, when there's false accusations, when there's division, and when there's politics, especially in the church. Sometimes it's in those moments that our motivation deep down inside is revealed. And unfortunately, sometimes in those situations, decisions are made for self-preservation instead of for the furtherance of the gospel. Unfortunately, it would seem that this is kind of the situation that um, was revealed with Demas. On the other hand, in verse 11, he says, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for the ministry. Now, this, this was awesome because, on the other hand, you have someone named Mark, and for you students of the Scripture, you know this is John Mark. This is uh, the individual who went with Barnabas and Paul on that first missionary journey. And while they were just about to enter into modern-day Turkey, John Mark, for some reason, abandoned that missions team and went back to uh, Anti Syrian Antioch. And the Apostle Paul was not happy about it, so much so that when Barnabas and Paul went on their second missionary journey, 
Barnabas, the son of encouragement, the uncle to John Mark, wanted John Mark to go with them, but Paul, remembering how John Mark had abandoned them, said, absolutely not. You know, we're, we're not taking him. He wouldn't be a strength to the team. He would be a weakness to the team. There was a great division between Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas ended up taking John Mark, and he took his own route on his second missions trip. Paul ended up taking Silas, and then they went in the opposite direction. So, you know, you, you look at John Mark, and you think, man, there was this failure in his life. This failure had an impact. Uh, is there any hope for us when there's failure? And the answer is yes. Not only was John Mark used on that second missionary journey with Barnabas, but he ultimately ended up writing the gospel according to Mark. And so, you know, here God has redeemed him in such a mighty way. And then at the end of Paul's life, Paul has been reconciled with Mark. They've been reunited in the ministry. And Paul says these powerful words with respect to the ministry. He has become useful for the ministry. And I'm thankful for that. You know, I'm grateful that, that it is the heart of God always to restore. And, you know, God will take us in the midst of our failures. And if we're humble and repentant and, and we sincerely transparently confess to him and invite his mercy and his grace into our lives, you know, he takes great joy in restoring us and taking, you know, what is perceived as a failure in our lives and turning it around for his glory. So, you know, maybe tonight you've been in that spot. Maybe there's failure. Maybe you've made uh, a mistake. Maybe you've crossed a line. Maybe you know, you've sinned and, and you're in that spot now where you're thinking, man, can God do anything with me? Can God turn this situation around? Have, have I lost the calling of God on my life? And John Mark is just a, a great reminder for you and for me that it is the pleasure of God to bring us to a place of restoration. God is never done with you. As long as you have breath in your lungs and a heart that is beating, God has a heart for you, and his desire is always to use your life for his glory if you and I will just sincerely and honestly come to him in repentance and let him do that good work in our lives. Verse 12 says, And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. So um, Cretans and Titus were dispatched for the ministry. Tychicus was dispatched to Ephesus. And then a little autobiographical piece, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchment. So hoping to see Timothy again, um, he uh, asked Timothy to bring a couple of things, you know, his, his uh, jacket and um, some books, you know, and parchments, probably some scrolls, and then some uh, books that were written on animal hide, uh, Paul for sure was a student of the scripture. He loved, I'm, I have no doubt, to read. The, the city that he was raised in, Tarsus, boasted the uh, greatest library in the Roman world. And so he was an educated man. And, and not only that, but um, I'm sure his plan as it was in his first imprisonment was to, was to write epistles you know, to churches that they might be encouraged. Verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works, you also must be beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. And um, so he names another person, not in a positive light, but uh, this individual Alexander. By the way, the, the name Alexander appears a number of times in the New Testament, uh, in the book of Acts, uh, earlier in his epistle to Timothy. Um, but don't necessarily just connect this name to those names because it was a common name at the time. I don't think that this is one of those individuals. I think that this is a different individual. Um, he was probably, as a coppersmith, he was uh, engaged in probably creating figurines uh, that were idols that people used for worship. And um, this was a lucrative industry at the time. In fact, uh, if you read about the planting of the church in Ephesus, you know that there was um, a great threat to the silversmiths in Ephesus because the gospel was being preached. People were turning away from their idolatry. They ceased worshiping the goddess Diana. 
And those who were in the industry of making all those little idols and making a lot of money off of them were very frustrated at those who were preaching this message of abandoning idolatry. Uh, and, you know, the result of that was a riot uh, in the theater there in Ephesus and persecution of the early church. And so most likely what's happening is this uh, individual's livelihood, his wealth, was being impacted by the gospel, and so he was standing uh, very firmly against those who were messengers of the gospel. The Apostle Paul had been impacted personally in this, uh, and his ministry had been impacted. Um, I do appreciate what Paul says here, though, because, you know, in those moments when people stand against you and the calling of God on your life, and they do it uh, in a way where you, you yourself are really impacted, sometimes, you know, we want to take retribution up into our own hands. Sometimes in those moments where someone's come against us and it's hurt us um, or it's hurt our ministry, sometimes, you know, I mean, if you're anything like me, you're tempted to respond in the flesh. Uh, you, sometimes we think that, that executing our own retribution is going to solve the situation and as much as Paul probably suffered at the hands of this individual, he does not take vengeance into his own hands. He says, may the Lord repay him according to his works. He understood that the issue of vengeance was always better left in the hands of God. Look, if you want to get yourself in real trouble, then take vengeance into your own hands and try to execute it on behalf of God. I'm, I'm telling you, from personal experience, nothing good ever comes from that. It will never ultimately produce the righteousness of God. Paul said this to the church at Rome with respect to the issue of vengeance. He said, Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, what do you do? Let him starve, the Bible says. No, it doesn't say that. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And you know, when your heart is a raging fire with vengeance, that is a fire that ultimately will consume you and it will consume the loved ones around you. So Paul left the issue of vengeance in the hands of God. He was also wise enough to say to Timothy, man, watch out for that guy. You know, just watch out for him. Be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Like, don't be ignorant or naive. Like, that guy's going to stand against you, and, you know, you need to be wise with respect to how you deal with him. Verse 16, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Man, this is, this is such a heavy verse. So Paul's first defense um, some commentators would say, well, this is the first time that he was in Rome under house arrest. Um, others would say, no, this is his second time, but his first defense when he stood before most likely the Senate. And, um, and so it was in that moment, you know, as, as it was clear that things were not going to go for, well for the Apostle Paul. I, th this is my view that we're talking about his second imprisonment, but his first defense in his second imprisonment you know, where it was obvious that Paul was going to be martyred for his faith. And, and probably if you're hanging around Paul at that moment, you're thinking, man, anybody connected to this guy is, you know, most likely going to be martyred as well. And what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. This, and this blows me away. He says, at my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. So those individuals that could have stood and, and given character witness those individuals close to Paul that could have supported him in that moment um, as he was su going to suffer as a martyr for his faith in Christ. He was not supported. He was forsaken. And, um, and, and that shocks me. You know, it just, it just does shock me because, you know, sometimes we have this picture of the early church uh, in a way where it's like, hey, they all stood strong together. You know, when there was a moment of opposition, they really had each other's backs. They supported each other. And I, look, I think that that was probably true for the most part, but not in this moment with the Apostle Paul. And, you know, you don't get, from a leadership perspective, you don't get any stronger of a leader than the Apostle Paul. So you think, man, was it, 
Was it a weak leadership style that led to uh, the fracturing of these relationships and, and the willingness of people to, to ultimately forsake him? Um, and I don't, I don't think that that's the case, you know? I think the truth is ministry is dif- difficult sometimes. And it's in those moments that, that people really uh, are confronted with hard decisions to make. I think that, you know, it was um, a similar thing with the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not that they didn't love the Lord, but even Christ was forsaken in the garden. Did that mean that he was not a, a good leader? No, there wasn't any better leader than Jesus Christ. But it's in those moments of adversity that human nature is revealed. You know, motivations, like I said earlier, motivations of our heart are really on display and, um, and our, our willingness to love each other through the hard times uh, becomes, becomes transparent. Proverbs 17, 17 says this, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. You know, you will really know who your friends are when things get difficult in your life. And I love the reality as well that Paul didn't get bitter over this. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't all torn up and upset and bitter against these people and, and hoping that they would suffer for forsaking him. You know, he says, may it not be charged against them. There was still that, that mercy and that grace the apostle Paul had, even when he was abandoned by those who were closest to him. And you know, you, I, you have to be thinking right now, how, that's a miracle, right? How does somebody live like that? How can someone be in a place where they, where they experience the grace of God in their lives, even when they've been abandoned by those who are closest to him? And I want to give you the answer. Check this out, verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Look, this is it right here. How can you experience that that miracle of grace and mercy in the midst of abandonment or being forsaken? It's, It's remembering, always remembering that if even if everybody leaves you, God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. In that moment when everyone had fled, Paul knew ultimately that he was not alone, that, that Christ himself was fulfilling his promise of being present to the very end. Deuteronomy 31.8 says this, and I pray your heart's encouraged by it tonight. And the Lord... He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. You know, that is such a a strong, strong verse. And, you know, one I believe that God wants to encourage you with tonight. Sometimes we look to people to do for us what only God can do. Sometimes we look for people to fill that place of God within our lives. And you know, God sometimes will intentionally allow people to be sifted out of your life so that you learn a greater reliance upon him. And and I think that the Apostle Paul understood that uh, not only was his heavenly father faithful not to forsake him, but that even in all of that, there was a, a lesson of learning a deeper reliance upon God in that. Sometimes we, and it's, it's good to have friends. It's good to build trust relationships. You know, it is, it's important for us. I want to be a man that can be relied upon. But you know, there's only one that can be relied upon 100% of the time. There's only one who will never fail you. Does that mean we say, well, people will fail you all the time, so you just can't trust people? No, that's absurd. You know, that's absurd. What kind of relationship would that be? What kind of relationship would your marriage be if you couldn't trust your spouse? Like, we're supposed to be trustworthy, but there is only one who will come through 100% of the time and never fail you, and that 
is God. And it's in that spot, look, it's in that place when you're trusting in him and you're feeding on his faithfulness and you're relying upon his presence and you know that he'll never abandon you and you, you've come to grips with the reality that he is orchestrating sovereignly details in your life. It's in that place where your heart is kept in a, in a place of healing where even if you're abandoned or forsaken, your heart's not filled with bitterness because there's something greater that's happening in you, and that's the presence of God in your life. Look, I, I think it's easy to be overcome by bitterness. I think it's easy to be frustrated with the failure of people in our lives. And that road, if you choose to walk down that road and focus on the failure of others in your life, it will lead you to a prison of your own making. Instead, what God wants for us is he wants us to, to trust in him. He wants our hearts to be filled with grace and mercy for the people around us. He wants to supernaturally enable us to be even kind and gracious to the people who have aligned themselves against us as our enemies. Because ultimately, as Paul says here, you know, he's going to be faithful to deliver you from every evil work and preserve you for that eternal kingdom that he has made and shaped you for. Uh, and praise God for that. He wraps up and says this in verse 19, greet uh, Prissa and Aquila. That's probably Priscilla and Aquila. And the household of Onesiphorus, Erastus stayed in Corinth. But Tro Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Father, thank you for these amazing words. And, and God, thank you for uh, your work through the Apostle Paul and how we benefit today. We benefit today, God, through your faithfulness to him. And we're grateful, Lord, that you've spoken to us tonight. God, we need our hearts to be at peace with your purposes. God, as circumstances work out around us, help us, Lord, to look to you. God, to lean upon your presence in our lives, to guard our hearts from being Im embittered. God, help us to be refined in our motivations and our desires and that ultimately for us as with the apostle paul we would be able to not just say but to be able to live for me to live as christ and to die as gain tonight as we're closing the service um, i just want to encourage you tonight as as we're wrapping up in prayer you know maybe you've never put your trust and faith in jesus christ and and I, I want to just say to you tonight that the relationship that God desires with you is not a relationship that's instituted by the church. The church does not stand between you and God. There's no religious leader that stands between you and God. There's one person that stands between you and God, and that's his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And the good news of the gospel is this, that when you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you are delivered from your sins, you're made a son or a daughter of the living God, and God gives you a purpose, a plan, a reason for living. You'll experience real, sincere satisfaction in your life as you turn your life over to Jesus Christ. You know, it's no accident tonight that you're watching. Maybe you're not a Christian. You've never really dedicated your life to the person of Christ. You've never turned away from unbelief and from sin and just poured your faith, your whole faith, into the person of Jesus. Tonight, God is calling you to that. God wants you to be part of his eternal family. God wants you to have the assurance that when you take your last breath here, on this earth, you will take your first breath in heaven, that you can belong to him forever. Tonight, if this is you and God's been speaking to you, you know there have been things that have been happening in your life and you've been, you've been drawing near to God. You, you've desired a relationship with him. I want to lead you in a very simple prayer that begins your relationship with God. It's the very first step for you to take, and that is 
repentance of your sin and faith in Jesus Christ. It all starts with the prayer, and you can pray that prayer right now with me. Let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes, and I want you to follow me in this prayer. God, today, thank you for speaking to me. God, I've heard your voice. And today, I'm turning to your son in faith. God, turning away from my sin, turning away from my unbelief, And today I'm choosing Christ, choosing to follow him, choosing to trust in him, choosing to live my life as his disciple. God, I pray, fill me with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you followed me in prayer tonight, I want to welcome you into the family of God. You've taken your first step in an amazing relationship, and God is going to day by day blow you away with his love. Uh, We're excited for you and we want to connect with you. We want to hear your story, uh, the the things that God's been doing in your life. We want to make sure you have a Bible. Uh, We want to encourage you in some next steps to take as a believer in Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you to go to cclasvegas.org forward slash connect. There's a button there that says, I prayed. want to encourage you to click that button, share with us your information and give us the opportunity to minister to you. What God's doing in your life is really important to us, and uh, we want to make sure you get all you can out of your relationship with the Lord. God bless you guys tonight. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Don't forget, next Sunday night, I will see you right here at Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas, in the gym. We're going to worship God together. Can't wait to see you then. God bless you.